It is interesting to note that, assuming the turret faceplate was mounted at approximately 45 degrees to the vertical, calculation indicates the inability of the modern 16-inch US projectiles to penetrate a plate of this gauge at any range. However, as can be seen from figure 7, the plate broke in half on both the complete and incomplete penetrations, and a failure of this type in service would partially or perhaps completely disable the turret. In late November of 1944, the Shinano was transferring from Yokosuka Dockyards to Kirei Dockyards in order to be completed when the vessel was torpedoed by a submarine and sunk. This would appear to be the end of Shinano's story. However, that is not exactly the case, as multiple components from Shinano when she was being built as a battleship survived in Japan only to be occupied by the United States following World War II, and this included virtually an entire turret, though it was in pieces. The United States would examine the components that created the turret and write a 59-page report on the functionality of the turret. However, they were not quite done with the turret itself. They were highly fascinated with the 26-inch thick faceplate, which was the thickest piece of steel armor ever mounted on a warship. Of course, with this being the post-World War II United States environment, they were fascinated with blowing up everything they got their hands on, which ranged anywhere from this steel plate all the way up to a full-size capital ship during atomic bomb test. But rather than dropping atomic bombs on this steel plate, they simply decided to take one of the 16-inch 50 caliber guns from the Iowa-class battleships and lob the best shell available during World War II right into the face of the turret. Before discussing the tests themselves, there are a few notes about the test that I want to make clear. The first one being, this is highly unrealistic. Namely because, one, the faceplate is the only component present here, it is not in the turret itself, and it is not properly supported as would be seen in the turret, which increases its risk of cracking in half due to no fallback support. The three 18-inch guns in a real battle scenario would pose as an obstacle to actually striking the faceplate, with these not being present nor any mock-up in the way, it is a direct path straight into the faceplate. The faceplate is being set up at a zero degree angle, rather than being angled back 45 degrees as would be seen on the real turret. This is because the United States is working under the assumption that the Iowa is shooting Yamato at maximum range, and the shell is coming down at a 45 degree angle, which would strike perpendicular on the real ship. The United States is going to compensate for this, which I will note in a few moments when discussing the test, but it is worth noting that hitting the faceplate at this distance is highly unlikely, almost unrealistic, as even hitting a ship Yamato size itself at this distance is a difficult task, even with the United States radar. With those few notes out of the way, let's move on to the test. Test number one would be conducted on the 16th of October, 1946. The projectile being used would be a United States Navy 2,700 pound, 16 inch Mark 8 Mod 6, AP with inert filler. The shell would strike the faceplate at approximately zero degrees angle with a striking velocity of 1,992 feet per second or 607.2 meters per second. Now those of you who are familiar with the Iowa's 16 inch 50 caliber gun, you hear this striking velocity and go, wait one moment, that sounds rather low. This is where the United States compensated for the distance that the shell is supposed to be striking the faceplate. If it is shooting at maximum range, the shell is going to naturally slow over the distance it has to travel, and in order to do this during the test, the United States used less propellant charges than would normally be seen in the maximum muzzle velocity of 2,800 feet per second, or 853 meters per second. Moving back to the test, the shell would strike the faceplate near the center at the upper joint with the roof. This is the piece from the faceplate that is now on display at the United States Navy Memorial Museum at the Washington Navy Yard in Washington, D.C., which is what you can see on your screen. The impact of the shell was quite decisive during this test. The shell would completely penetrate the 26-inch plate and split it in half, though this can be noted due to being poorly supported during the test. There was also a series of cracking and fracturing of the plate, 
and the inner armor was layered as can be seen in the pages of a book. The reaction of the steel in this test relates back to the steel's origin itself. This type of steel making is a World War I method, which was first implemented on the Congo as far as Japanese ships are concerned. It is Vickers hardened steel, though in the case of Yamato it is known as Japanese Vickers hardened steel due to the Japanese slightly tweaking it for the era, which makes it the best type of Vickers hardened steel available at the time. It does not have an increased resistance, but nor is the resistance decreased when a shell impacts, meaning that the plate itself has a proper effective thickness of approximately 26 inches. It is worth noting now that the types of steel that the United States and Great Britain were using in the 1930s and 40s is of higher quality than the Japanese, but the Japanese are not too far behind. With these results in hand, the United States conducts a second test on the 23rd of October, 1946, using the exact same projectile. However, the striking velocity is slightly less this time at 1,707 feet per second, or 502.3 meters per second. The shell would also strike the plate quite a bit lower. It's now about halfway down the turret faceplate, just off to the left of the left gun port. The results of impact number two are slightly different from number one. The shell, unlike one, does not completely penetrate the armor, only managing to punch through 21 inches, though there is a hole all the way through the 26 inch thick plate. The plate fatigues, cracks, and fails once again, which results in it splitting in half, but as could be said with test one, this could relate back to being poorly supported. With the conclusion of test number two, that is the end of testing altogether. The United States would only fire two shells into the faceplate. Now it is time for conclusions. It is worth noting that there has never been another test with a 26 inch thick piece of steel in this type of scenario, which means there is nothing else to really look upon to give a proper judgment as to how well the Japanese armor held up, aka was it good or not. However, the test was not completely in vain. The United States noted that the Japanese did create really good Vickers hardened steel, which can be compared to the best Vickers hardened steel from the World War I era, which is what the Japanese were trying for anyway. As it's clear, they were not attempting to make steel up to the standards of the United States and Britain in the 1930s and 40s era. It is also noted that the intersections of the steel is brittle, which is common amongst Vickers hardened steel, so it's not a mistake in the Japanese production line. However, this brittleness does not reduce the armor's ability to stop a shell, but rather it just fractures and fatigues and cracks, which could disable one of the guns or disable the entire turret altogether if a fire sparks or a large chunk of the plate actually does fall away down into the turret. So to summarize the conclusions, there was no shell at the time of Yamato's existence that could actually penetrate the 26 inch plate clean through, However, due to the fatigue of the armor, it was possible to disable a component of the turret if struck, or potentially the entire turret if struck enough times. With that having been said, hopefully you have enjoyed today's video. If so, why not subscribe and leave a comment down below, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.